Yen dva, yen dva. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for such a big attendance. Uh, give yourself a, a warm welcome applause. Come on, let, let me see. Excellent. Thank you, thank you again for coming. My name is Goran Grinec and I'll be the moderator of uh, this uh, guest lecture. Uh, welcome to, the, uh, to January's program of six international festival of art, robotics and new technologies called Device Art. Uh, Triennial Festival began its Zagreb's program uh, with a, a celebration opening of a central exhibition, Machines Are Not Alone, in which it represents 25 artists and their 21 work, which uh, map contemporary functioning of machines and also its human cohibition with people and mankind. Uh, the exhibition can be, uh, you can visit the exhibition uh, up until the 3rd of February, so if you haven't visited yet, I strongly recommend that. Uh, before beginning of uh, this uh, special guest lecture of Mate Rimac. Uh, I, I presume uh, Mate doesn't need any special introduction. I would like to draw your attention uh, to two programs, two performances, which organizer of this international festival, uh, Bureau of Contemporary Art Container, uh, has presented to you and uh, has organized for you. One of those uh, special performances is Binary Cinema, uh, which will be held uh, this Saturday and this Sunday from 2 to 5 and 30 p.m. here in MSU, in which uh, you can see a device, art, uh, device arts uh, movie program, uh, movie slash films program, uh, which is curated by uh, Hrvoje Pushkets. If you're interested in subjects such as artificial intelligence, uh, androids, robots, uh, please be uh, completely aware that you need to reserve this Saturday and Sunday for those five movies. Also, second performance, second program that I'd like to introduce to you uh, that you must not miss is uh, sound performances. Device Art will be uh, will uh, will welcome five young uh, European artists, uh, which uh, which fire, which found their passion in sound and technology. Zagreb's program uh, begins also on Saturday, but from 6 p.m. And before we continue with this lecture, uh, if you have remembered what you need to see, and if you haven't, uh, please be sure that you can find all the information on uh, Container's website, and that's container.org, or you can follow us on our social networks as such as Facebook and Instagram. And uh, before uh, I introduce Mate, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Bureau for Contemporary Art Container for bringing Mate here, and also, uh, I would like you to give Mate once again a big round of applause uh, and uh, enjoy his art and passion, the cars. Uh, after, the, after the lecture, we'll have a time for Q&A, so please, if you have any questions, uh, prepare yourself for the end of this lecture. And uh, with all, uh, without further ado, please, once again, big round of applause, Mate Rimaci of Viva Sartori. Mate, kick Thank you. Thanks. I'll stand up, it's weird for me to sit <laughs> while presenting. Um, so thanks for the invitation. Uh, I didn't know that there will be so many people. <laughs> I thought it's going to be a small group of people here uh, from the arts perspective. Uh, I have uh, lectured a lot of times regarding entrepreneurship and technology on technical universities and on uh, startup events and stuff like that. I never did something similar to this. And I started to do the presentation, I think yesterday, 11 at night. So sorry if it's a little bit messy, it's everything thrown together. Uh, and I'm not an artist, very far from that. And I'm not the designer of the cars. Uh, I guess that our head of design, Adriano Mudri, would be much better for this presentation. But uh, I'll give you my perspective. Maybe it's something interesting, maybe not so much, but uh, I'll throw a little bit of everything in, inside a little bit of the uh, technological aspect, a little bit of the, um, I would say, um, design aspect that's interesting for me, and a little bit about ourselves, so you understand the company if you haven't heard about us before. So, uh, first, 
I think it's important that everything starts with passion. So for me, cars are something that I was passionate about all my life. So um, as you can see, I didn't even go to the toilets when, when I was a kid uh, without, my, without my cars. Um, so I don't know why I was born with that. Uh, nobody in my surroundings had anything to do with cars. Um, but since ever I can remember and before that, my, my parents, my relatives are telling me stories about cars before I could walk or talk. So, cars are for me a combination of many things. Um, in, if you look at Leonardo da Vinci, he was combining um, arts and science uh, and creating machines or ideas for machines. And in kind of that way, I'm also inspired by cars. Uh, it's a lot. I think it's a combination of everything, of material science, of chemistry, software, electronics, uh, simulations, uh, different material sciences, production methodologies. It's such a complex device that combines everything that humanity is doing into one product. I don't think that there are many other products in the world that combine so many different uh, fields and so many interesting uh, angles to one single product. It's actually incredible that we can buy a car today for relatively little money because the companies need to invest billions and billions of dollars to develop those cars. And then we go and buy them for 20, 30, whatever thousand euros, which in reality, if there wasn't the economy of scale, is worth billions. So that's really fascinating to me. Um, and always, um, like, it's not like other products that just have to do their job. It's everything about the car is important. Every little detail has is matter, uh, matters, uh, including uh, the interior, exterior, and many things you wouldn't think of. Um, and that's what's fascinating to me, so that it's always a combination of engineering and science and, and also art in some way. At least for myself, it's also art. So, um, I hope the videos work. Can you, can you try it? Just click on the video. Shame if it doesn't work. Yeah, try it. Just click on the play button. Ah, a shame. Okay, sorry for this. Um, so, uh, this was basically a video of a 5 axis CNC machine milling uh, upright, so part of the suspension of the car out of aluminum block. Um, it's a very factory like thing, so things that happen in factories. But the whole machinery moving and manipulating that part. Uh, maybe while uh, I speak about this, maybe you can download QuickTime player, <laughs> then, it, then the video can work. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, like that's that's something that's uh, maybe very um, engineering like, but for me it's fascinating. I love I love CNC machine parts. Uh, I'm not sure how much you are familiar with different production methodologies, but for example, mass-produced cars, all the metal parts are basically casted. And they are a little bit rough, they, they are not, they don't have this nicely finished surface. Machine parts do. And like, that's one of the things that uh, I'm drawn to. Like, I, I love to have uh, aluminum and machine parts in the car. So, an example of that is, for example, on the left. So, it's an aluminum part, and if it was casted, it wouldn't look anything specific but not, uh, as it is machined, it has this beautiful surface finish. And when you see the 5-axis milling machine producing that, unfortunately you couldn't see that, it's like, a, it's like a ballet. It's like a dance of the machine and the tool and the part dancing around producing that part. Like, that little detail for me is like one of the things that, that gets me going. And then on the other side, another material, carbon fiber. It's, it's a plastic, but it has a beautiful texture, has a beautiful surface. Of course you can paint it and then you, then you don't see it anymore, but putting that carbon fiber in the right direction, at the right angle, designing it in the right way so that you use the opportunities that the material gives you, is something that, in my opinion, uh, is a form of art. And some cars do that very, really good, some don't. Uh, the very specialist, very exclusive cars do that very well. Uh, big, a big hero of mine, Horacio Pagani, which car is on the left, uh, on the right, so this is the uh, Pagani Huayra, or Pagani Zonda, I'm not sure which, which one, I think the Huayra. 
uh, they have perfected this. They are like the opticians of the industry producing beautiful carbon fiber parts. So that's like the little details that are really interesting to me and that draw me to this. So in some way, I think the car is a combination of art and science in every way. So if you just look at the design of the car, many people will think about the left part, like people drawing something on the paper, but it's very, very far from that. So a designer has to consider everything, aerodynamics, regulations. Uh, for example, in the front car, in the front of the car, what's really critical is the pedestrian impact. So there is special regulations and special crash tests that you have to do to satisfy safety regulations in terms of when a person, when you uh, hit the person on the road, that the person doesn't get injured or doesn't get injured too badly. So a lot of those things are defined by the constraints. So you know when people say no compromises, that's usually bullshit because you have so many different constraints to which you have to adhere to achieve some kind of best compromise. For example, I have to play often the police between uh, the designers and the engineers because the designers want something that the engineers can achieve. The designers say they can, but they just need to work harder. The engineers say the designers are crazy, it's never going to work. And um, somebody has to say, okay, we are going to stop here. We are going to do what engineer wants or what design wants. But just aerodynamics, like to achieve the shape of the car, we have done millions and millions of simulations, millions of iterations and supercomputers and testing um, to achieve the shape we want. It's easy to design something, but something that works, that you can produce, that can satisfy the requirements um, and still look good, um, it's, it's really difficult and combines a lot of, it's a big team effort. So this is a big team effort. And we have a great designer, Adriano Modi, uh, and I see that Daniel is here in the audience, who has connected me with Adriano 10 years ago and basically kicked this whole thing off, more or less. Um, so I think he, he is one of the best guys uh, currently in the industry doing this. So out of all of these constraints, I think what we get in the end, if everybody does a good job, is automotive art, at least for me. So what we also wanted always to achieve was not just a car that's functional, not just a car that's fast and so on, but it has to look sexy, it has to look nice. Just a little bit background story how I personally got into this. So this was 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when I was in high school. I was just doing a school project uh, because I had to do something for graduation. Didn't think anything specific about it, but my professor liked the idea. And he sent me to the, national, uh, to the local uh, Zagreb County competition for electronics. And I didn't think anything specific of that, but um, surprisingly, I won that uh, competition. Then they sent me to the national level uh, for electronics, which I also won th that year. And then they sent me all over the world to represent Croatia uh, on different competitions. And um, I didn't expect anything on the local and national level, especially not on the, on the international level. <coughs> but I won a bunch of awards, uh, which was a very good experience. And uh, wrote two patents before I was 18 years old. But so I was always doing something in my garage, always fiddling around with electronics and those kind of things. Um, and then those things in the high school that I did. But I was always crazy about cars and couldn't wait to have my driver's license. So when I was 18 years old, um, I bought this 1984 uh, BMW, which was four years older than myself, um, to. I wanted to get into racing, and this was the easiest way to get into racing. You just needed a rear-wheel drive car and a few spare wheels. Um, so I did quite stupid things with that car. Let's see if the video works. No? Okay, you'll have to skip the video. Sorry, guys. Um, so the car didn't last for very long. The engine blew up like after the second race, and I... Um, I uh, ended up without, without the, the car, so I took the engine out and I was thinking about this idea for a long time, like um, that electric cars are, that electric motors are very interesting and very powerful, so I was wondering why nobody was using uh, those motors to really make interesting, exciting and fast cars. So it was a really like rusty old BMW and um, you know, being from Croatia, as, as most of you here I guess, 
I was very interested in Nikola Tesla and, and his inventions, especially the electric motor. So this is one of the prototypes that he has in front of him. <coughs> and if you know a little bit about, about technology, you know how complex and, uh, um, and inefficient combustion engines are. So you need thousands of parts, you need lubrication, cooling, uh, valves, lots of different uh, parts. And in the end, you get like 20% to 30% thermal efficiency. So 20 to 30% of the energy that comes into the engine gets converted into kinetic energy. The electric motor is quite different. It's much less moving parts, has incredible torque density, doesn't need a clutch, doesn't need a gearbox really, and doesn't, uh, is much more efficient, so 90 plus percent efficiency. So I was wondering why is nobody using this machine to power uh, a sports car, a race car? So uh, I went into the garage and uh, wanted to convert this old BMW into, into a race car that proves that electric cars can be fast and exciting. And unfortunately, again, we don't have the video of that stuff be happening in the garage. Um, but one of the interesting things uh, which I have in this video and why I also wanted to, came, to come here. <coughs> so when, um, when uh, Tesla launched their first car, the Tesla Roadster, it was just about the same time when, when I was doing this. Uh, they uh, they uh, came to Croatia, one of the early cars came to Croatia like to launch the first charging station. And they were launching that here, just in front of this building. Um, there was the prime minister and president and I don't know, whoever from Croatia and they came with this Tesla Roadster and I was like uh, surprised that they would call the, the, like Tesla to open up the charging stations um, instead of somebody in Croatia who was doing electric cars. <coughs> so I wasn't invited <laughs> but I waited around the corner knowing that they would pass there and then challenged the car, challenged the Tesla Roadster and they had all the German television stations there and so on. Uh, so it was interesting because they also had the minister of um, um, minister of police, whatever, in interior, yeah, whatever, um, here. So he actually closed the road behind this uh, this road behind us uh, with two police cars or with, like two police bikes, and we organized the race here. It's actually a German television. We have that still on YouTube, I think, um, and. I was racing with the BMW against the Tesla Roadster, which was at that time considered the fastest electric car in the world, and I beat it. Uh, so that was an interesting story. <laughs> so that was, that was the last time I was here. So I, I wanted to come back like eight years later. So uh, so, anyways, with this BMW, I get a lot of experience. I was racing um, everywhere. And at the beginning, the people were like laughing. What are you doing with the electric car on, on the racetrack? Like, <coughs> they didn't expect to see an electric car. Ne nobody ever really saw an electric car on the racetrack competing against gas powered cars. You had all of these fire spitting V8 race cars, uh, specially designed for those races. And then I come in this little green BMW without any noise and start kicking their asses. Uh, I mean, in the beginning, the, the car was not fast, it would, uh, it would uh, have problems, it would break and so on. But after every race, I kept coming back and the people that were laughing, the people that were making fun of me at the beginning realized, okay, there's something going on, he's uh, persistent and coming back. And then eventually I started winning. And uh, you know what they say, first they laugh uh, at you, then they, uh, no, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you and then, then they fight you. So then, because the car was quite fast and successful, they tried to ban electric cars from racing because it was like an unfair advantage, which it really wasn't. Uh, so anyways, it was a great experience with this BMW, but I also wanted to do much more. I didn't want just to convert an old BMW into a race car. I was reading a lot about these guys. They are really my heroes. Uh, we have Hrazia Pagani on the right, the guy I mentioned before, the artisan of the industry. I think he is, he, he is really obsessed with, with Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, he is doing his cars in Italy. It's really more of a piece of art than, than a car. We, we are much more about technology and performance. Pagani is really about, um, about the artisan part of the, of, of the product. So I think he would be actually the best guy to stand here instead of me. Uh, so he was a great inspiration for me. And Christian von Koenigsegg from Sweden. 
So the car industry is really difficult. It's used in uh, books as, as examples of the industry with the highest entry barriers, like where it's really difficult to get into. And hundreds of people have tried and failed. Pretty much everybody in the last 50, 60 years has tried and failed. So Tesla is basically the only new car company in the last 70 years in the, in the US. Um, so these guys are one of the very, very few that in the last five, six decades have created a car company that still exists. So I was chasing them uh, like, you know, it's difficult a little bit also to imagine how it was 10 years ago. Like there was not so much information out there. Today you have dozens of interviews of these guys on YouTube. Back then it wasn't like that. In 10 years lots of things have changed. So I was once going to Geneva to, to try to catch those guys and I went to the Koenigsegg stand and I ran into a guy who looked most serious so I thought that's the CEO. But actually it was his father, or Christian's father who gave me Christian's business card and I wrote him about the stuff that I was doing with the BMW and that I wanted to build my own car. And Christian is a very smart forward thinking guy so he said, hmm, okay. Uh, maybe there is going to be electric cars in the future and uh, like this is interesting like keep me updated and like now 10 years later we are friends I'm friends with both and we work for both of them so it's like a close <laughs> circle like my big heroes people that I was admiring now they are coming to Zagreb we are producing batteries for, Koen for Koenigsegg um, for the hybrid car and we are working on some projects with, with Pagani so, uh, but basically I wanted to achieve what they were doing, building a car, building your own car company. <coughs> and I wanted not just to make any car, I wanted to make the world's fastest car. But uh, we are such a tiny country and I was just a guy in a garage in an industry that's dominated by the huge dogs, by the, by the big dogs, by big car companies. Uh, I will show you some examples. Most of the car companies are five times bigger uh, than Croatia's GDP. The, the big car companies, all of Croatia. So, uh, perception of electric cars back then was something like this. So, nothing sexy, nothing interesting. Um, it was more of a... So, it was de developed by people usually who didn't like cars. It was more developed by people who wanted to have a very uh, efficient form of transport to reduce con congestion and to reduce emissions which is a perfectly fine and a noble goal, of course, but not what people want. People are passionate about cars, and um, this, you know, was for many people laughable. And then Croatia and cars, we didn't have much of a car industry, <laughs> fortunately, uh, a little bit here with the old country, which was not really in Croatia, but at least something. So, um, this is a video of how beautiful Croatia is, and Croatia is really beautiful. I'm a, I consider myself a patriot. I think that we have the most beautiful country in the world. Um, and it's really an amazing place to spend your vacation, to enjoy the nature and so on. But it's not really for, for uh, high-tech industry, and not for, especially not for automotive industry. So this is a picture that I didn't do it. You just Google automotive industry in Europe, and it gives you this um, dots and, and stars basically showing you where the big uh, suppliers and, and car companies are and pretty much the only country in Europe uh, that doesn't have a single spot is Croatia <laughs> so uh, even countries like you know countries you wouldn't expect like Portugal has tons of car industry or Spain or uh, you wouldn't believe Romania and Bulgaria how much industry they have uh, grown in the last 20 years. It's mind-blowing. I have been, I've been in uh, Romania last year a few times. It's like, wow, like little cities like Timisoara or, or Cluj have, have so much industry now there. Uh, not to mention Slovakia, who is now the biggest exporters of, exporter of cars per capita in the world. Just to give you some example, I'll probably get the numbers wrong, but uh, Croatia has, I think, uh, something like 20 billion dollars of export or something like that. Uh, Slovakia is 70 with the same number of people. They have 1 million people more, so they have 5 million people. Slovenia has, uh, with half the people, I believe three times the export of Croatia. Slovakia is exporting more cars than Croatia is exporting in total. So just to put things in perspective, so Croatia's export, oh yeah, 13 billion export, sorry. So the GDP is 60 billion dollars. 
Um, and here, for example, a, a company in the industry, Hyundai, um, had to, uh, 217 billions of revenue. So one, co one company in the auto industry is much stronger financially than our whole country. So it's, it's an unlikely uh, location to start a car company. And people ask me often, why did you stay in Croatia? Well, I wanted to, to really do it here, to show that we can do it here. But also like, you know, why is Ferrari in Modena? Because Enzo Ferrari started in Modena. Why is Porsche in Stuttgart? Because Ferdinand Porsche started a company there. And I believe that we can do it here. And that's why I'm trying. And despite um, everybody thinking that we are crazy by staying here and people being surprised that we are doing it here, um, we, are, we are still persistent in that. So to do this was a really long, long story and strong and difficult, um, difficult challenges that we had to overcome. Um, in the early days, we had uh, some, uh, let's say, not the best investors in the world, but they were, <laughs> they were um, helping us in the beginning. Um, so we had very early interest. So at the, at the time, basically, uh, I was working on the BMW and I wanted to make my own car. And I met Adriano, our head of design today. Adriano was working for GM at the time in, in Opel. And I don't know how, but Daniel somehow connected us. Uh, so uh, we started to, to work on, uh, I told him about the story. I told him I want to make my own car. And Adriano started to do the design. I was working on the technical part, but there was no company. There was no office. There was no garage. There was nothing. We didn't have employees. We didn't have a facility, nothing. And through the BMW, we were, the, the BMW was in the media. People were writing about it. There is a crazy green electric car driving around and uh, uh, racing against gas powered cars. And then because of that, a guy came to me in Zagreb and he said, look, I'm working for a royal family in the Middle East. They are always interested in some projects. Do you have something that I could show? And Adriano and I put together a, a brochure with some pictures of the car, what would become the concept one I mentioned later, some specifications like numbers that we thought we could achieve, like acceleration, top speed, and so on. And he went with that to Abu Dhabi. And a few days later, he said, they want to buy two cars. And I was like, great, but there's no company, there's no car, there's nothing. Then a couple of days later, he called me and asked, how much do you need? And I was like, I have absolutely no idea. We threw together a business plan. And what I'm signing here is the term sheet. And when they sent me the term sheet, it was like, what is a term sheet? Uh, so it had clauses in there like drag along, tag along, right of first refusal. And I was looking for a lawyer in Zagreb who could help me with that, like who could understand that. And I couldn't find a lawyer. Like I was sitting in the lawyer's office and, and he said like, hmm, I think drag along means this. And I'm like, no, I think it means this. So, so the lawyer didn't have any idea because such deals are not really common in Croatia. So anyways, it took us a long time to negotiate this. And at the same time, we agreed that one of the milestones we have to achieve is to show the car at the Frankfurt Motor Show, which was in September. And this was early, so September 2011. So this was like late 2010, early 2011, and we started. So, uh, so the, a few friends of mine that, uh, that I knew, uh, I convinced them to, uh, to uh, let their jobs go. They had to convince their wives. And we started working. Like nobody of us had any idea what we were doing. Adriano was still in Germany, working for GM and working at night on the car, sending us the data. We were six guys, six guys working day and night, day and night. We rented the facility in Sveta Nedja. They didn't go home sometimes for three days. We were staying there, sleeping on the floor. Um, most of those guys, like, I think everybody, everybody is still in the company. Um, all, all of these guys, one of them will leave this guy who is sleeping over there because <laughs> after 10 years living like this, it's enough for him. <laughs> Actually, he was in the Croatian army during the war, like I think for 17 years. And I asked him, Igor, but how, how did you survive the war if you are burned out now? He said, this is much worse than war. <laughs> <laughs> so I can understand the poor guy. Um, so anyways, uh, it, was, it was like we, we had no idea what we were doing and uh, we, we, we were so struggling, the investors in the end uh, screwed us. Uh, we, we run out 
completely out of money. They throw, they wanted to throw us out of the facility. I couldn't pay the salaries. I couldn't pay the rent. We couldn't pay the electricity. We couldn't pay suppliers. And we worked our asses off to build this car because it was our last chance. Like, if we don't do this, then we are done before we even started. We were still born. But we, we like, screwing the car together on the truck, driving it to Frankfurt. We did it. So, um, I, I won't focus much more on the historical aspect because it will take too long. Uh, just to, to wrap it up, like, so this was actually nine years ago. So, eight years ago today, I was still a guy in this garage. And uh, today, we are more than 500 people in several locations um, in Croatia and, and in other places. So, it was a tough time. Uh, you know when people say time flies? For me, it feels like from this to, to this, it feels like I have lived five lives. It's, it's just so intense and so, yeah, challenging in so many ways. And the people <laughs> who, who are with us for some time know, know uh, to which we went through. So yeah, but we, uh, the biggest miracle is actually that we are still around. <laughs> we were at so many near-death situations, so many times it was on the razor's edge. Uh, that I think our biggest achievement is that we are still alive. Uh, but I would say that we are now beyond this point of, um, let's say, what they call in startups, dead valley, where it's really like survival on a day-to-day basis. So in the last, let's say, one year, we, we, are, we have stabilized and don't have to worry about surviving the next month. So this is our growth. It's quite fast. So as you can see, it was long, very slow. Like, we were just, like, surviving and trying to, to somehow uh, to attract investments and more projects and so on. And, um, yeah, and then we, we kind of had different stages of growth. Now we are, um, so this is, this is from uh, October last year. So since then, I think it's another, I guess, 30, 40 people. So we are, we are well beyond 500. So the yellow part is great. So the guys on, on the right here that are our sister company making bikes. So yeah, we are in Split, Osijek, and we are building a factory in Xiangyang in, in China, and we are now starting also location in, in Slovenia. Um, so investors are a big part of, of everything. Uh, my, personal, like, my personal top priority from the beginning was always to get the money, to get the companies to survive, and uh, doing the investments. And we were doing this on our own. We didn't have any like, uh, investment bankers or advisors or something like that who do this for us and people are quite surprised about that usually. Um, so I was doing all the investments around until now. Um, and a big deal for us was <coughs> sorry, that Porsche invested in us uh, last year. So that was pretty big news for the industry that Porsche has invested in, in Rimac. It took us three years and it was yeah, a big, uh, big achievement for us. So now we are working with many of the industry brands but also being part of the Volkswagen group in a way but I mean, they're, they're minority shareholders, so they don't control the company. We can still work for other companies. Anyways, uh, so what's really important is, is the culture in the company. And that's really most important for me. Unfortunately, I have to battle with, with investors and customers and uh, those kind of things a lot of time. But whenever I can, I, I really try to do something good for, for the people. I really like, I, I like the history of Hyundai. So the guy who has founded Hyundai, he has founded it to employ as many people as possible. Like a very industry intensive industry, building cars. Like, uh, for example, Samsung has a lot of more um, revenues and profits than Hyundai, which is also a Korean company. But Hyundai has a lot of more employees. So he wanted to create the industrial base to give people jobs. And I find it very, very noble. So for us also, like, uh, often we put, or, especially myself, I put the interest of others in, in, in front of, uh, let's say, the interest of the company and, and my own interest, and doing things that are maybe not rational, but I think are the right thing to do. So, for example, if you look at Pagani and Koenigsegg, who are much older companies than we are, we have more than double employees than they have, um, and in a much, much shorter time. So, uh, what, what I really try to do is, and we are all in the company, that we have a good culture, that we uh, respect our people, that we treat our people well. So we think, or I hope, that we are much more than, than just a place to work, that we are more of a family, more of friends. Um, and we do things together, like we are, we are not really uh, 
yeah, just normal guys, I, I think a little bit crazy. Uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously. You might notice that beautiful girl over there. It's me on our Christmas party. <laughs> so uh, we are not guys in suits. And we are international. Uh, so this is a little bit older picture. We have, I think now, 28 nationalities in the uh, company, which is quite unusual for Croatia. Because people usually go out of Croatia to work in Germany and in Austria and uh, Ireland and so on. We want to show that we just we don't just uh, keep Croatians in Croatia, but that uh, we can attract uh, people from outside to come into Croatia and that they love it here. All of the guys that come here, they love it. They consider themselves to be from Samobor, from Zagreb. Uh, they have their uh, favorite restaurants, their favorite uh, coffee shops, and they love it. Um, no matter where they come from. So. Uh, this is something that I'm really proud of, and that that we have created a company that attracts people from all over the world. Yeah. So, but <laughs> coming back to uh, to the to the technology. So, uh, I also want uh, I always wanted not just to make an electric car, but actually make the uh, a sports car better. So to use the opportunities of electric propulsion to make electric cars more exciting, more. Uh, so, sorry, to make sports cars more exciting, more adjustable, more fun, uh, more interesting. So one of the things, for example, that we do, so here what you can see is a, a one axle on the old car, the Concept 1, uh, which is uh, two electric motors in one housing. So uh, it, it basically controls two wheels independently. So one of the systems in the front, one in the rear, and you can control every wheel separately um, and very precisely adjust how the car behaves. So that's something that you cannot really do in this way with a traditional powertrain, with a combustion engine. So it was not just about making the car, uh, you know, going from combustion engine to an electric powertrain, but really use the advantages, use the potential of the powertrain to make the car better. So unfortunately, we will not be able to play the video again, but here you would see how uh, one of our cars is beating gas-powered cars like a Lamborghini and, and LaFerrari and Bugatti and so on in acceleration. One of the things where electric cars are really good at. And something that would be hard to imagine 10 years ago when the image of electric cars was as it was, like boring and slow and so on. Uh, yeah, after this video, maybe some of you know, we also had some uh, interesting moments. <laughs> so this was a big crash that we had in Switzerland where the guy was uh, luckily escaped the life, but it took like 10 years out of my life. Uh, so many people tell us it's the best thing that happened to us because it was all over the media and the whole world, but I, I would rather that it didn't happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's another video that I cannot show you, like racing against Teslas and stuff like that. And th this guy, so so who knows who, who this is? Okay, yeah, people know him. So he, he hates he hated electric cars. So Tesla sued him after he tested their cars um, because they were making stuff up and so on. Um, and he was always joking about electric cars and he has tried everything. And he said that our car changed his mind, that it blow, that it has blown his mind and almost his strength. <laughs> so uh, it was um, it's a big honor and like that a little company like us changes at least a little bit the perception so what we wanted to achieve at the beginning change that perception of the little like toaster car into exciting fun and fast we have kind of achieved that in a way so basically the company is two parts of businesses <coughs> what, what i forget to tell you to survive at the beginning you know developing a car is a very long-term process big car companies need like five or seven years to develop a car from scratch even more in some cases and uh, when we had the, the early prototype it was very far from being a real car so the, the red car you saw on the Frankfurt Motor Show it was it was not a real uh, production car it was very far from that so we couldn't sell that car and we couldn't deliver it so we couldn't make any money from that so the only way for us to survive without the, with investors stepping out was to start working for the industry, was to start developing technology for them. That's what kept us alive and now became basically our main uh, business. So the supercars are very, very important for us, this Concept 1 and now the C2, because there we are developing new technologies and applying them 
to, to project and showing what we can do. And then basically using that to um, do things for, for the industry. Um, so these two business models work very well hand in hand. One wouldn't work without the other. So just about the business model very shortly, like in the beginning when we were a small company, we would do like prototypes, like one unit. Then the last few years, we were doing small volume production for road cars. So from prototype to road car, <clears throat> it's a big difference because you need to do all the crash testing and stuff like that. Uh, so that's quite difficult. And now what we are doing is for us high volume projects. So, uh, so when I talk about this, I'm talking about components. <coughs> so the right part of the business. So the cars, we will always stay in low volume production, just like a uh, few dozens of cars per year, uh, because we don't also want to compete with our customers. Um, but in terms of the uh, components, we want to scale up and produce thousands and tens of thousands of units. And for that, we are now building a new factory and so on. So we have worked for a lot of the companies in the industry. Uh, for some of them are public, like the SEAT project, Aston Martin, Jaguar, Koenigsegg, and so on. Some of them are not public. So uh, we work basically for many companies in the industry. Uh, just a little bit about the cars. So the Concept One was an interesting car at its time. It was the first uh, real electric hypercar, uh, so 1,200 horsepower, um, 2.50 to 100 and so on. But it was our first car and we did a lot of mistakes there. We were doing it for the first time and like it, it's historically significant, but on the other side, like when I look at it, I'm ashamed about how many things we did wrong. And it's because we didn't know, we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the experience, we didn't have the time. So. You know what they say, if you're not ashamed about your first product, it means you launched too, too late. So we <laughs> launched probably a little bit too early, uh, but it, it, it worked out that way. So the concept one was interesting in terms of the performance, but in many things it was not on the level where we wanted it. So the C2 was basically in the plan from the beginning. But uh, so for, for somebody who is from outside, it would look like, okay, this is a supercar, this is a supercar, where's the big difference? It's light years difference. So we are investing millions of engineering hours into this car, hundreds of times more than we did in the Concept One. We are doing things on a completely different level, completely different investment, completely different team that has all the experience and all of the years behind us in the last 10 years, what we, are, what we have been building and doing. So it's not just the fastest electric car, it's the most powerful car ever presented. So it's, it will be, when we start shipping in 2020, the most powerful, um, car, road car um, sold, so 1,900 horsepower, uh, less than two seconds, zero to 100 and so on. So, but as you can see also, I believe beautiful. It's not kitsch, nothing in this car is there for just show. Like everything is optimized and developed just to be, uh, just to work in an optimal way. So every air intake, everything that you see there, the, the wheels, like the cover on the wheels, everything is there for a reason and for a purpose. Um, some car manufacturers do a very uh, aggressive design, which is not necessary, which is just there to, to look nice or to look aggressive. In our case, uh, we, we, we are not, our brand is about technology and not about showing off. We try to be subtle, um, but, but still functional. So, yeah. We, we think that we have created a piece of technology and art in a way with this car. Um, so also in an interview. So what is really fascinating for me about cars is that absolutely everything has to be uh, designed. How the button feels, how, the, how it feels when you close the door, how it sounds when you close the door, how it feels uh, when you turn the steering wheel. Like everything is an experience and it can be a visual experience on how you look at things, how, how it looks like. It can be uh, a sensual experience, like how it feels under your fingers uh, when you touch the materials. It can be a sound, and everything is usually designed in the car. Nothing is coincidence, which is very rarely the case in other, um, in other products. So what we are very proud of is that we have built a team of now over, one, uh, over 250 engineers that are developing the whole car in, in uh, Croatia. <coughs> here in Svetanaida, and I can just see Martin sitting here, so he's doing this actually. <laughs> so uh, developing the, so this looks like some nice colorful pictures, but this is actually uh, millions of, <coughs> of elements 
uh, being simulated uh, with real physics behind it in supercomputers. So uh, this is, for example, to achieve all the global crash tests. So for example, the concept one, we didn't do this. We did just the simulations. For the C2, we are doing global homologation and certification, which means we are now building 30 prototypes, most of which will be destroyed. And every car is 1.7 million euros. So we can only do that now when we have the investment from all the investors. Before, with the concept one, we of course couldn't do this. And we didn't have the experience and know-how to even do this. So uh, the car is not just a car. It's a lot of technologies that come from the car. Uh, new powertrain, new battery, new platform, all the electronics and so on. And uh, yeah, so basically you can see here how the whole development process looks like. So different simulations for aerodynamics, for cooling. Like uh, computers are very, like uh, in the last few decades what has changed is that you can do millions of iterations in the computer very accurately before you do an actual prototype. So what we do is tests on a small scale uh, then simulate that, so for example, you test the material, the carbon fiber material, to understand how it will behave in such a crash, because how else will you know uh, how the carbon fiber will behave in this impact? You have to test the material to put the data into the system. Then you do simulations. But to get to the simulations, it's a lot of iterations before, like to package everything, to have enough space to to make everything work, the aerodynamics, the, the components that are, for example, in the door, like the uh, window mechanism, the airbag, uh, having enough room for the, for the uh, elbows and all, all of those kind of things uh, that have to, have to be taken into account. Then we do uh, all of these simulations. And then, for example, after that, uh, just a sec, then we do uh, tests. So this is not the real car. This is a... a like a model that you test in the wind tunnel where, uh, so it's the next step from simulation to real testing. So why I'm showing you this, it's to understand the whole process to get to a design. Sometimes car manufacturers show a beautiful concept car on the car show, it's beautiful. And then five years later, the same car is presented in production form and everybody's so disappointed. Like why, you, you did such a beautiful car there why is it ugly now? Like, what the hell did you do? You could just have built this. But it's not just like that. You cannot just put anything into production. It's lots of these constraints and tests and uh, requirements that have to be fulfilled. So to uh, achieve what the designers want is a very long process and you, most of the times it doesn't work. Um, so anyways, this is, this is one of the steps that uh, it has to go through. I won't bother you too much with the technical stuff, with simulations and those kind of things. So development of batteries uh, is something where we are very active in, but I guess that's not so interesting for you, the cooling systems of batteries and those kind of stuff, all the electronics, uh, simulations and so on. Uh, I will just skip this. Maybe if you have questions about it, we can go further later. But like, just I will stop here a little bit. Like this is the development process of the motor where you develop the magnetics, the thermal uh, behavior of the motor, the mechanical behavior of the motor, uh, the mechanical design of the motor, all the flow simulations, uh, all this mathematical modeling. And I think it's beautiful actually. Like, it's a, it's a very technical uh, topic, but uh, what, what we say is like, if it doesn't look good, it usually also doesn't work good. So, um, when something has to make sense in a way. So for example, if it's a very messy, powertrain, like a very messy compartment under the bonnet, probably something is not right and somebody didn't approach it from the, from the right angle. So we also try to make our components look beautiful. So here, for example, uh, our gearbox system, uh, I guess this is a little bit too technical for, for this um, uh, discussion. So also what we work on a lot is autonomous driving functions. So here we have some videos to show you how the car perceives its environment and how it knows and understands where it is. Um, and the artificial intelligence, the neural networks behind it doing their job. And I think it's pretty interesting and looks a little bit uh, like from some future movie, uh, future uh, sci-fi movies, but unfortunately I will not be able to show you this because of the videos. And this is the point I was trying to make earlier. So other products are complex as well. So airplanes, for example, they are very complex products. So 
they, they are difficult to make. Also, a lot of engineering, lots of simulation, lots of testing, lots of responsibility because of safety and so on. But they don't have the same requirement on detail like cars. So they have lots of displays and controls and buttons and I don't know, lots of stuff in there. But nobody really cares how it looks like as long as it's reachable, as long as it's like clear to understand and so on, ergonomical. <coughs> but nobody cares how the click feels on this button and if it's the same click like on that button. Because the instruments that you see in there, probably they come from 20 different suppliers. And I don't think that anybody in the aviation industry gives a damn if that supplier and that supplier have the same button feel. But in the auto industry, they do. Everything is taken care of. So for example, Mercedes has 200 sound engineers. 200 people that engineer every sound in the car, every click of a button, closing of the doors. Some people would laugh, but you have people inside of laboratories listening to the closing of doors all day long. What? And it's this subconscious things that you maybe not recognize, but when you close the door of a Mercedes, you have some subconsciously the feeling of quality. And in some other cars, maybe not. So everything that's uh, directly visual or things that you would never imagine are uh, important in the car industry, while in other industries it's not. And that's why cars are so fascinating to me. And that's what we are also trying to do. Like, not just do the things that are on the surface, just the things that people see, but really those things that people might never see and spend extra effort and extra time on them. So all the little buttons, how they feel, how they click. So this is an example of a, of a sound um, laboratory where BMW in this case tests different aspects of the car uh, in terms of sound. So lots of microphones around the car and so on. And as I said, things you would never expect. Uh, how the wipers sound, how the uh, adjustment of the seat sounds, all of these things. Um, so this is uh, to show you how the design process looks like. <coughs> For example, in our company, but I guess it's similar in, in other uh, companies. So at the beginning, there is an idea of a product. So where do you position it? How do you benchmark it against other uh, cars? Where do you see it in terms of uh, functionality versus status symbol, uh, usability versus uh, uh, fun factor, uh, more for the road or more for the racetrack, uh, more comfort or more extreme, uh, more driver focused or more to be driven in. Uh, all of these different aspects. And then you have like, what, what's really difficult is to quantify all of these different aspects of a vehicle. So it's easy to say, I want the car to go like 200 kilometers per hour or 300 kilometers per hour, um, or to have 600 kilometers of range. But there are so many other aspects to a car that uh, we have to quantify. Like how much space do we want for, uh, like from, from the hip, from the H point to the, uh, the roof? How, how big of a per person do we want to fit in? What is the transition rate between acceleration and deceleration? How does the car behave uh, when you go uh, through a, a fast turn? Like what's the uh, yaw rate? Uh, what's the g-force? What's the uh, kinematics of the suspension, uh, all of these aspects have to be defined as good as possible at the beginning. And then the design team, based on that, makes some kind of ideation, very rough sketches. And then out of a bunch of different concepts, you choose a direction in which you go in. And then it's a lot of discussions with engineering, uh, testing different materials, testing different concepts, 3D printing them, sitting in bucks, uh, trying out this kind of button, that kind of button, but how does it work together with the display? What do you do on the touch screen? What do you do on the button? Uh, how do you get into the car? Like, if you want more space to get comfortably into the car, you have less chassis material, will it survive the crash test? So it's a million and million and million uh, different inputs and options, endless op options, which you have to choose to come to a, to a solution. In some cars, it's easier where the requirements are not so high, but in cars like this, where you try absolutely to push the limits of everything and uh, still achieve the crash test and still uh, be comfortable, it's really difficult to bring all of those together. So the guys are doing a bunch of sketches and 3D prints and 3D models, uh, put it on the wall. I think that's quite important to put stuff like that on the wall, like to, to see it, to discuss about it. 
And then also what's important is to create um, a DNA, a design DNA. So when you see a new model that you don't have to look at the badge to, to see that it's a BMW or a Ferrari or in this case a Riemanns. So one of the things that we have also done is this little feature on the side which is the cravat. So we try to have it as a symbol of Croatia to see that the car is from Croatia and we like to tell the story. Um, and in this case you can see it, it can light up in different colors so when you charge the car it can show you that it charges like with green color but you can also make like a Croatian flag on the, on the cravat. So. Um, yeah, and then of course the R&D is involved a lot with the, with the design together to uh, achieve the vision of the designers to come to that point. So a few things that I wanted to show you that I find really beautiful. So for somebody else they might not be beautiful, but for me they are. Like this is, this is something that um, drives me. Like I love to see when we make a new part, when, when it comes together, it's like uh, usually uh, it has also to look beautiful. So this is a battery, for example, that you produced for Koenigsegg. So my hero that I showed you at the beginning, now we are doing batteries for them. It's actually the highest power density battery in the industry. It's, um, it's, uh, one, uh, it's 500, ki 500 kilowatts uh, out of just 70 kilos. So in that regard, it's the highest in the industry. By the way, uh, interesting to mention, so of the three hypercars that are coming out, uh, oh, sorry, five hypercars that are coming out, so the uh, Aston Martin Valkyrie, Koenigsegg Regera, uh, Mercedes Project One, the Rimac C2, and the Pininfarina PF0, we are producing and developing the batteries for four out of five. So, <laughs> Sveta Nedja is a world market leader in high performance car batteries. <laughs> So this is another battery which we did for Jaguar. So this is the battery which was in the car in which uh, uh, Prince Harry, I think Harry is it? Harry and um, Meghan got married. So this was also quite interesting. And like things that are just like that nobody will see the electronics in the car, like the power distribution unit in this case or the battery management system. Like it, it, it's sometimes a coincidence that it looks nice, but sometimes like now more and more we also invest the extra effort and the extra time, like to make even those components that nobody will ever see nice. And I have some maybe little hidden features in them, some, you know, Easter eggs. You know, it's like the spice of life, the little things that, that you don't see. <clears throat> and also like things like this, the key and stuff like that. So, uh, or here, this is a simulation for cooling of the battery system. So this is a computer generated uh, result of the, how the liquid flows inside of the battery pack. And I find it really cool. I, yeah, uh, I would like to put a picture of that in my uh, apartment. So this is the flow of uh, current uh, um, on, in the battery pack. So on the connections between the battery cells. Uh, so I think it's kind of art and science in a way. Um, so, and then again, all of these little details, by the way, this is not leather, it's, it's a synthetic material, so it's vegan. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, a combination of all of these different materials, uh, milled aluminum, uh, electronics, um, all that together is for me like a symphony. And all of these things that you would never see, like this is something that nobody will really see because it's hidden be behind the steering wheel, but we still try to make it beautiful. And then, of course, the whole digital aspect of the experience, the infotainment system, the app on your phone uh, to control the car, and all of these other bits and pieces that are... And also the factory, of course. So um, this is our old factory where we are currently. Uh, and we, we are building a completely new campus. Uh, we hope to move there in two, two years, which will be ten times bigger than where we are now. And we are really paying a lot of attention to make that really something special. I cannot show you that today, unfortunately, yet, but um, I think it will be pretty mind-blowing. But still, also in this location, like, if you see other factories, they are often dirty and um, messy and so on. Uh, but there is no reason, like, if you pay attention, if it's important for you, if you walk by every day and tell, like, why is this on the floor? Why is this dirty? Like, it can be better. Like, uh, if you put the extra effort in, you know, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. So, I think that's a philosophy that can be applied every, everywhere. And even the mechanics, so this is the Pagani, the Pagani Huayra, uh, can be like beautiful when you lift the bonnet. So for some people, the Pagani is more beautiful when you lift the bonnet, when you see the hidden parts, than uh, when it's uh, just closed. 
So uh, this is the philosophy of Pagani. Why, why would the parts that you don't see be ugly? And what I'm saying is uh, an ugly part and a beautiful part can cost the same. There's absolutely no reason that the ugly part would cost less in most cases. So uh, th that's you know, just so that somebody cares. This shows you that somebody cares and has put the extra effort into, into your product, into the thing that you own, to make it not just, you know, just make it, but really to make it the best possible and piece of art in this case. So for me, it's also like beautiful <laughs> uh, how, uh, like this is a car that we did for Seat. Like when we cool it and the, the dry ice blows out the, the dust, uh, the like fog uh, you know, from the cooling system, like this is, this is something beautiful for me. And I don't have really paintings in my house. Uh, so this is the kind of art that I have in my house. So uh, maybe I'm a little bit crazy, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what drives me. And what I love to see is our products, like uh, when, you know, this is a photo in America, where, you know, our cars are there and, you know, you see them in motion, all this hard work, and then the cars are there and, and people enjoy them. So uh, I hope that there will be many more of these and that we will still stay, stay true to our philosophy, that we give the extra effort to make beautiful products um, and create beautiful um, things and build a great company around it, create many jobs in Croatia. That's what I'm trying to achieve and that's what everybody in the company is working on um, and give our little contribution to uh, have some nice products but also to the local economy and create great jobs along the way. So thank you very much. Thank you once again. Uh, Mate, please join me. Please join me. Uh, before we start Q&A from the people in the audience, I have a few questions for you. Uh, you have shown us uh, the picture of uh, Nikola Tesla and also some sketches from uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and would you agree with me that uh, both of those people are geniuses? Absolutely. Okay. And also people say that there is a thin line between genius and lunacy. Uh, how many times have you crossed it and uh, how did you get back? <laughs> how do we define that? I don't know. I have the feeling I became like a robot, like an input-output device, uh, where I get inputs in forms of emails and requests and stuff like that. And I just became very fast to process that and give outputs uh, because that's what I'm doing for the last 10 years. Um, so I, I don't really know. Can a robot be insane? <laughs> yeah, of course. Have you watched Blade Runner? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, and also, uh, all of us here know the story of your of your success. But I don't think that uh, many of us actually know uh, what is the sacrifice that you have to invest to be such a successful entrepreneur. And I would like, uh, if you can do it um, in a few sentences, uh, could you please describe your working day? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say that we are that I'm successful. I think we are on the way. Like, I, I still think we are very early. Like, it's difficult when you are in Croatia and then look at us and like you think that we have made it because of the surrounding and the reference points. Uh, but we never measure ourselves locally. And like for me, success would be four things. So I, I know what, what, what how I would define success. Uh, get the C2 on the market. Like. Uh, shipping cars every day out of the factory, uh, having uh, like the mass production of the components running, the things that we have planned now and that we are working on, but not done yet. So I have like thousands of batteries leaving the company every every month, uh, having hundreds of millions of euros of revenue and a, a stable company that is uh, not depending on uh, constant investment, and building a new campus. Uh, so those four things, when we do that, uh, then I would say that we you, have, you will consider yourself successful. Yeah, but before that, I, uh, we, we are still like, our odds of surviving are now higher than they were, but they are still uh, relatively low. Like, we could fail. Uh, Don't say that. The, Don't like, say that. It's the reality. It's the rea I always told that people when I was employing them, especially in the early days, like, uh, you know, now everybody knows about us, at least here in Croatia, but uh, like five years ago, people didn't know, and I told them, look, you know, this is the kind of company that you will come into, like there is risk. Uh, you have to accept that risk. Maybe I will not be able to pay you next month. 
So I wanted to be transparent with the people. And luckily, we managed to survive, but our, uh, how high is the percentage that will survive? I hope more than 50%, I really hope. Uh, but it's still a long, long way. Uh, but to answer your question, how a day looks like, um, I'll tell you the last, let's say, a couple of days. So it was weekend, I was in the company until one in the morning. I think I sent you the presentation something like one in the morning. Uh, I went home and came back to the company at six or seven, something like that. Uh, and after this, I will go back to the company and be alone until 10. <laughs> wow. So if I'm not traveling, I'm in the company all the time. Uh, does that affect your health? How do you, how do you keep yourself healthy uh, in that such a, such a strong pace? Uh, I don't have, luckily, any problems, knock on wood. Uh, I guess that's because I'm young, I'm 30 years old. Uh, my girlfriend tells me all the time, like, you will die. <laughs> we all will die, we all will die, so she's like... Uh, I don't know, I, I, luckily, I don't, any, I don't go to the doctor or anything like that. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm sick, I don't know it. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Stay positive, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm okay, like, I don't mind. You know, for me, the difficult thing it was... When I was working my ass off and everybody else in the company and I, I didn't know if we are going to survive next month. Like that was really, really tough. 2017 was the worst year because we had a really, really tough year and the whole year I was just like, every day we could have died. Every day in 2017 was the worst day, the worst year of my life. Uh, and uh, now it, it's a different pressure. We have pressure to deliver products, to, to not uh, screw up in the projects that we do and stuff like that. Um, but uh, and it's very hard work, but it's not a problem for me because uh, we don't have this pressure of survival. So that that's the really difficult thing when you when you work really hard and you do many things right. Of course, you also do many things wrong, and then you don't know if you are still going to like if the, if the company is still going to exist next month. So. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm not going to uh, interrogate you anymore, so I'm going to put these questions away. Uh, does anybody have a question? Uh, of course, if you don't feel comfortable speaking English, you can ask the question in Croatian. Mate, do you speak Croatian? Fluently, I presume. So, every question with tvrdo ch, tako da. Ima li neko pitanje, bilo kako? Stvarno, znači, došli ste poslušati rimca, imate priliku postaviti pitanje, evo, javi, evo, gdje. Nemo je ovak dizat ruku, volim te. Gospodin Iza, pucaj. Is this it? Yeah, awesome. So, first off, thank you for showing that there's still people around with, you know, ambitions and goals, which is really nice, especially in Croatia. So, my question would be kind of, this is the first time I saw you kind of hoping to move into more of like a mass production of parts, not into cars. So, this is like a long-term goal. Um, is this a shift that came about at some point, or I mean, could you oh, tell us more about that? Yeah, thanks for the question. That's, that's something that people are confused about a lot. Like, that was our uh, strategy from the beginning, but the car is so visible. Like, that's such a visible part of the, of the company that the people don't understand the main part of the business. Uh, it has always been like that pretty much from the beginning, maybe like half a year after I started, because we that was the thing we, that kept us alive. Um, but, like, do you know a, a company that produces batteries for cars? Yeah, they, they produce it for their own cars, but who makes it for Porsche? Who makes it for Mercedes? Like people don't know that, of course, because it's not a, it's not a visible uh, company. So our strategy has been like that for for long time, uh, but of course people recognize the car more. And what? Why do we do this? So let's say. I get this question often, why don't you make a, a cheap and affordable car for, for Croatian people and stuff like that? Um, well, it, it's different answers, like one, one of the answers is Tesla has invested 15 billion dollars so far. They have 40,000 employees in Silicon Valley. They had money at the right time in 2008 when the whole economy was going down. Um, and they got the best people at that time when the other car companies were firing people and in a bad position. Uh, and with all of that brain power, with all of that money, with being the uh, most prolific company in the industry, they, have, uh, they are still struggling to produce an affordable car. So to produce an affordable car would take so much investment and so much brain power, so many people, it, it, it would be like, this is impossible in, in Croatia, uh, but to do something in that direction would be absolutely impossible. Uh, but even do it anywhere, you can see that with Tesla it's really difficult. There's lots of companies that are trying to copy Tesla, lots of them, 
um, I didn't put the slide in, but there are startups now in the last couple of years, not when I started, that raised billions of dollars from Chinese billionaires and stuff like that uh, uh, with the promise of building affordable cars and so on. And a lot of them went bankrupt because building cars is much, much harder than people think. So uh, building a supercar is really hard, uh, but luckily it's expensive. So we can afford uh, to like pay uh, 10,000 euros for a light, you know? And to get a light down from 10,000 euros to, to 30 euros, how much the big car manufacturers pay, it's like impossible for us. They have 100 years history with those suppliers, with materials, with how to engineer parts to be um, efficiently produced and so on. So that's absolutely impossible. So I'm sure of that. And, and so that's answer number one. Answer number two is uh, Ferrari is producing cars for 70 years and they still produce expensive cars. So we are good at producing sports cars and we don't, we don't think that, we, we think there are better people to produce affordable cars and there are many people trying to do that. And third question is, I think the com industry will completely change. You will not buy cars anymore, you will not drive them, you will not own them, you will use them as a service. Uh, you will still have the racehorses and the sports cars, but most of people will not care. Uh, just as none of us probably here has, has a horse, or maybe a few of you. Uh, but you, our parents and grandparents all have horses. And now, like two generations later, we don't anymore. And I think the same will happen with cars. So starting a car company now that will produce cars for the people, I think it's insane. It, that's that's not really a good business model. So uh, we, we are doing this only because we have started uh, some time ago and use it as a, a technology demonstrator and because also it's my passion. Uh, but the real business is the component business uh, where we are uh, providing what the industry needs. They need this stuff, it's new for them. You know, we, as I said, we cannot compete with them in making lights because they do it for a hundred years. But batteries, they don't do, for, I mean, Batteries are around for 200 years. Electric cars are around for 100 years. We are not, we haven't invented the electric car, but we are good at making batteries and powertrains and developing electric cars. And that's where we see the most realistic option to build a strong company. So that's why we do it. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, gentleman over there. Uh, somebody else? Okay. Um, so when Goran asked you uh, if uh, when Goran mentioned that you were that you made it, you redefined you defined what made it means. Yeah. Um, do you have a definition of what done means? When are you done? Personally, yep. <laughs> That's something that I'm thinking about a lot, and that people ask me a lot, and uh, I don't know. I, it's such a, like when I look at Lamborghini, he re he sold the company. He was forced to sold to sell the company early so the company bears his name but it was under Chrysler and so on now it's under Audi and I was like why the hell would you do that like such a great company like because we all have this picture in our head of like what other people are doing like when somebody thinks I'm the CEO of a supercar company they think it's you know amazing you drive supercars all the time um, <laughs> but it's it's not and I think that's with every job like be it a singer or whatever there's lots of hard work behind it that people don't see um, so, uh, like, I had offers to sell the company already a few years ago uh, for lots of money, but I'm, I'm not really motivated by money. Um, and, like, if I sell now or in five years, it would be more than 100 million euros anyway, so where is the difference? Uh, so, that's, that's off the table because I could have done that already some time ago. Uh, I want to build something really big and I have some ideas that are beyond. Um, some, some new ideas also. So I, I hope, like my, my challenge now is to structure the company that it can work without me in a way that of course I will still be fully involved in the company, but that I don't have to sacrifice everything else for it. Like that I can work maybe 10 hours and not 16 hours. Um, and I don't know really, I, did, I don't have an exit strategy. I don't have a plan to sell the company or something. But I would, do, I would like to do other things. I would like to do things about food. I would like to do some other things in, in transportation uh, that I also mentioned earlier because I think that's a huge shift. That it, like, I think that I know what will happen in the next 10 years in transport. And I feel that's like knowing what the iPhone would do in 2005. 
So I think that's a good opportunity uh, that you could do some things that are interesting there. Thank okay, you. thanks. Uh, can we continue? Uh, in the mid oh, okay. Uh, hi. I would uh, first say I really admire what you do, and I'm fascinated by the work you've, been, you've done in the last 10 years. It's incredible. Uh, 500 employees from 28 countries, so bravo, mate. Thanks. Uh, I'm curious, are you approached by airplane industry and boat industry? So, oh yeah, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so thanks. Um, basically, everybody's coming to us. Um, like, it's uh, it's something that you have to learn. I think when you are in a, in a business, that you have to learn to say no. Uh, w like, I was the guy who was saying yes to everything because I wanted to do everything. Oh, it's so sexy, it's so interesting, it's so cool to do a boat, to do uh, a, a flying car, whatever. Uh, we were, yeah, there's a company in Slovakia called Aeromobil uh, who is making a car that flies, like it has expendable uh, wings and we were do designing the battery and, and hybrid powertrain for that. There is a company in Slovenia called Quadrofoil that makes like a hovering uh, something boat and we were doing the uh, battery and power chain for the initial prototypes. So uh, th those are all interesting things, but uh, a company has to focus. Like you cannot do a million things at the same time. So we were doing those kind of crazy things before. And then Marco, who is now our head of business development, he joined the company five years ago. And he taught me to say no. Like I was always saying, oh, it's so interesting. We have to do this project. And he was saying like, no matter, we will, we will bankrupt if we continue to do so many things. So focus on the things we are really good at and uh, do that and be the best in the world in that. So that is kind of where, where we are going now. But to answer your question, like it's incredible what's happening now in the industry. Uh, we are involved in some projects and may maybe in a couple of years it, it will be public. But things that seemed impossible a few years ago that the big car companies would do, they're now doing. Like they are all working on, um, of course, obviously autonomous cars, but some of them have really also interesting uh, projects in terms of uh, um, the third dimension, let's say it like that. So uh, I think people will be surprised what will come in the next few years. I mean, we have seen some of them like now in, in CES, there was Bell with the, the Bell, the helicopter company, has uh, presented a, uh, like a, let's say, autonomous transport pod that's flying, like a helicopter with, uh, which is like a drone, like four or no, six, six of these big rotors. Um, there is Lilium <coughs> from Munich, who is making a vertical takeoff and landing uh, pod, which is like autonomous uh, flying taxi, if you want. And uh, there's serious development going into that direction, serious money going into that, which surprised me but uh, because it seemed like these conservative companies wouldn't do that, uh, but they are doing it. So this crazy thing about flying cars that people are dreaming about for a hundred years, where you could see, you know, uh, I think Gilles Verne has already had uh, those ideas and uh, now they are really becoming a reality. So people are doing that, we are involved in some, some areas, but uh, in reality, we want to focus on, on, like the car industry is so big, it's so huge. And our little niche, if we are really good in that, like I said, like from five hypercars we supply four, um, we, uh, like if we are really good at that, we can build a really significant, uh, like a substantial company. Thank you. Somebody else? The, the gentleman with the hat, please. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. And I would uh, uh, ask, uh, uh, like, uh, concept two is much better than concept one. And uh, I'm interested uh, what uh, can bring uh, concept free. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, people have started asking already inside the company what we are going to do next. I just want to finish the C2 first. It's such a huge task, such a huge project. Um, I'm not really sure, like, I'm not really sure how the car industry will look like in five years. And if it still makes sense to make a yet faster, yet um, uh, more powerful car and so on. So, the C2 when it comes out, we have really pushed, we have come so close to the limits of physics in so many areas, in so many aspects, in terms of performance, in terms of energy density of the batteries, power density and so on. Everything was so optimized for this car. Like, it's so rare. I, I think it's, it basically never happens in this industry. And 
I try to tell it to my team that they, I think they don't realize it. Like people who have worked on the McLaren F1, like 25 years ago or something like that, um, that's a part of their career for the rest of their life, like the highlight of their career, uh, because it has had so many achievements. And the C2, we have started, like everything was developed for one single purpose for this car. In, in other cars, it's never like that. There's always so much carryover, which means stuff from previous models or from other cars or uh, off the shelf parts. For the C2, uh, everything was so optimized and so developed for this car. Um, and we have gone so far with that to achieve these targets that we had at the beginning. So when we are done with it, it will be quite difficult to, to catch it, in my opinion. Uh, other companies will have to really work hard to achieve that um, level of performance and, and uh, the whole package of the car. Um, so it will be also hard for us to be better in that, uh, so, um, or significantly better. Uh, of course, we have ideas for the C3 and other cars, uh, but first, like, let's let's first. How, how do you say in Croatian? Prvo skoč pa na So So yeah, we first want to finish it, and then um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for now, the goal is to finish the car, the C2, bring it on the market, globally homologize it. It's a huge task. Everybody's working on that. Uh, we have hundreds of people waking up every morning. Uh, doing that, so I, I would keep C3 a little bit for later. <laughs> okay, thanks. Somebody else? Yeah, what's that? Anybody from this row? Uh, hi, Mate. Thank you for uh, that. Was a great presentation. I actually have two questions. Okay. The first one is uh, how did the Richard Hammond crash affected you and your company? And the second one is, uh, since this year the new Tesla Roadster is coming out, how do you think the C2 will compare in acceleration, top speed and every other segment? Thanks. Uh, okay, first is, I will answer the second question. So, Tesla Roadster was actually a little bit of a shock to us. Um, mm -hmm. I think I talked about it for, uh, already in some other interviews. So, um, when, so, a little bit technical. The Concept 1 had two uh, speed gearbox in the rear. It's a, horrible, big, expensive, complex, inefficient part. And so basically people think electric cars don't have gearboxes. They usually have a single speed gearbox, which is usually differential. So it's a single gear, which means basically like if you translate that to a normal car, that you drive all the time in your last gear. So if you have a normal car, that would mean that you drive in the fifth gear all the time, which means that you are in the fifth gear when you drive 20 kilometers per hour and that you are in the fifth gear when you drive top speed. That's an electric car usually. So, and gears are always a trade-off between acceleration and top speed. So, you all know when you ride a bicycle, when you are in high gear, you can drive fast, but you cannot go up the hill. When you are in low gear, you can go up the hill, but you cannot drive fast. It's the same with uh, electric motors, with combustion engines. Uh, the gearbox is a torque converter. It trades RPM for torque, torque on the wheel. So, uh, I, I hope I, I made it uh, simple. So, if you want to achieve Top speed, you can do that. If you want to achieve crazy acceleration, you can do that, but usually not both. So there is a compromise between the two. So in order to achieve the acceleration that we have for the Concept 1, it's a two-speed gearbox in the rear. Why just in the rear? Because when the car accelerates, the center of gravity of the car shifts to the back, so you have more traction in the rear wheels, the front wheel. I thought this is an art <laughs> discussion. <laughs> so, uh, so anyways, we had this horrible, huge thing in the rear, which is the two-speed gearbox on each side, which nobody ever has done for, for uh, an electric car to have two-speed gearboxes on each side, like four gearboxes. Um, and I wanted to get rid of that in the C2. So we developed a completely new powertrain for that, a completely new motor gearbox inverter to have the performance that I wanted with a single speed. Um, and I wanted 2.3 seconds to 100, which is very, very fast, and 330 top speed. And we wanted to show the car in Geneva, which was in March uh, of 2018. And then like three months before Geneva, uh, Tesla announced the Roadster with less than two seconds to 100, 400 kilometers per hour. Like, I was, how, how is that possible? Like, how can I do that? Um, and we did the calculations if it's possible, and it was. And we were like, okay, we cannot make the second fastest car. Let's go back to the drawing board. And it meant like <laughs> making the... 
two-speed gearbox. Uh, so we had to go back to a two-speed gearbox design because of the Tesla Roadster, and I'm very open about it. Like, because of that, we did the changes to the car, which makes it heavier, more complex. Uh, oh, by the way, we had to do like, we were working day and night from that moment on until Geneva to figure out if it's possible to make a two-speed gearbox because we already had defined the space for the motor, for the for the suspension, for the chassis and so on. So we didn't have the space. We had to do everything and design a crazy gearbox with like uh, Formula One material gears inside uh, and carbon fiber clutches and those kind of things uh, to make it work. So finally we achieved it. Um, and so now it's it should be quite a lot faster accelerating than Tesla Roadster, but then Elon Musk recently said that he will put SpaceX, SpaceX rocket boosters on the car, <laughs> trust us, uh, so that he will uh, accelerate faster than traction, uh, tire traction can do. So like, I don't know how to compete with Elon Musk. Uh, it's, it's not easy when your main competitor is Elon Musk. Uh, so I don't know, uh, I think it's a different segment. Um, I think our car will be more exciting to drive and more powerful. Uh, probably a lot more powerful, I think, but in terms of acceleration and other specifications, it will be close. So let's see. It will be, I think, you know, it's it's cool to have competition. Like, we were the only electric hypercar for quite some time that you could buy. And uh, it, it's not great to be the only one. Like, when Pini Farina came to us and wanted to build an electric hypercar, uh, they asked me, like, so Mate, what is the market for electric hypercars? And I said, eight concept ones. Like, that's the global market, so we, nobody knows how many electric hypercars you can sell. And uh, creating the whole market segment on your own is really difficult. So I think competition is good, the Pinafi Farina car will be interesting, the Tesla Roadster. So let's see, I think it will be close. But uh, the, the difficult thing is that the Tesla Roadster is much cheaper. So we are, of course, much more expensive, but it's always, like, if, if you're a car guy, you probably know about the Nissan GTR which was much faster than 90% of the supercars, which were like five times more expensive, but people were still buying also the supercars. So it's about different things. It's about the, the details, the design, uh, but we want to be best in performance. If we are going to achieve it without rocket boosters, we'll, we'll see. Uh, the first question, uh, Hammond crash. <coughs> so I have a whole report on that and I want to publish it sometimes, but I never have time. So the car has real-time data telemetry. So we are in real time receiving all the data that the car is collecting. It's like uh, 500 sensor inputs uh, being collected uh, every moment, like 100 hertz frequency. And we have all the data all the time. So uh, basically he was uh, driving the car for five days. So from Monday to Saturday, so six days, they were driving the car, testing the car. And we had a team there and I was here in Croatia. And every day the team would give us a report what they did with the car and everything was great, you know, every day they were doing something and we were very happy and we knew, like the team there knew how our car performed against uh, the others and we knew our car was much faster and we were looking at all the data and the car was fine and everything was good. Because we were scared, we were scared like what if something happens on that uh, event, like on that show, like other cars uh, caught uh, fire or something like that on the show and I was like, these guys can close their doors, like they are gone. There's absolutely no way that <laughs> they are going to survive after that. And I was scared of that. And then finally the last day, Saturday, like they had this hill climb race, which was the most difficult part. And they did it like four times. And every time they went up the hill, so it was a Saturday and I was in the company with the guys. Um, we, we understood like the car starts and we see the data and then the data disappears for like 20 minutes because there is no signal. And then when he gets back, the car sends the data. And then we see, first time he did 127, second time he did on this corner, like 144, then 177, then 190 something. Um, and it was kind of done, like there was like 15 minutes between each session. And already like one and a half hours has passed, no data, no driving. And we are happy, like we do something else, we don't look at the data anymore. The guys are calling us like, they are done, they have filmed everything, they are packing up, that's it. Um, and nobody looks at the screen anymore. And like two hours later, I get a call from one of our guys there, and I remember his words, like, uh, he crashed, the car is burning, he's alive. <laughs> and I was like, I think I just went pale, like white, like this, this table. And the guys there, they told me later, like they saw something bad happen, but I didn't know what to say, I just went out 
and I, I called Marco, my, my vice president of business development, and my girlfriend and told him what happened and went into the car and went home. And from the company until I went home, it was everywhere. It was in all the media in the world. The YouTube video already had like a million hits. Uh, <laughs> And like, wow, what the fuck is happening? Oh, and that was in 2017, in this, in this really, really bad year. We were just closing the... Uh, that's such a long story. <laughs> keep it short, keep it short. Yeah, I keep it short. So we were closing the investment with an investor, which we really needed the money, really. We needed the money so, so bad. Like, we needed it like six months ago. And, you know, and we needed every customer to pay us some time to just barely survive and, and none of our suppliers to sue us that we are late paying and stuff like that. So, so many things happening at the same time and then that happens. Uh, and what happened then, like, uh, the car was insured from theirs. Uh, we, we didn't even know that if it... Anyway, so, uh, to keep it short, uh, uh, we couldn't say anything about it, this because we were depending on, on the show to pay us uh, the insurance money because we needed the money uh, for, for the crashed car that we wanted to, I mean, it was supposed to be delivered to a customer. Uh, and uh, they, um, uh, they didn't let us to say anything about it. All of our customers were calling, all of our investors were calling. Everybody was, uh, like, Jaguar was calling and saying, Mata, will, will our batteries uh, burn like that as well? <laughs> so I had to make reports why this battery was burning, why this, uh, their one didn't, so uh, why he crashed. So from 144 to blah blah, and in the end he went 212 kilometers per hour on that corner. He he looked, he was trying to see this the, his time because he knew the time of everybody else. So he passed the finish line. He was trying to see the the time he did to see if he was faster than the other guys. And half a second in this car, uh, holding the throttle too long, you are 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, faster and he looked back, he, it was too late, it was too fast. Happens all the time, just this time it happened on the hill in Switzerland. He was flying 110 kilometers, uh, 110 uh, meters before he come to a stop. Uh, luckily, didn't have any major injury. Uh, two weeks later, I went to uh, UK and had an interview with Richard where we explained everything, what happened and so on. Uh, so it was really tough time for me. Like the world was falling down and it was horrible horrible time and it was really difficult and i i hate to remember it uh, some people think it's the best thing that happened to us uh, well i don't think so <laughs> yeah so it, it, in the end it turned out well that they, they paid us the insurance he he didn't have serious injuries it, like we were really surprised like jeremy clarkson said it's the worst crash he ever saw uh, so luckily he survived, otherwise it would have been, uh, yeah, not so good. Yeah, uh, we have a question here, sorry. Um, you didn't really talk about uh, ecology or uh, environmental, which is a big question around electric cars. Because uh, it's bullshit. Your, yeah, I wanted to know your thoughts about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's also a long answer. Um, yeah, yeah. That's what I usually say, like, my last slide is usually like, uh, um, if you really want to make a difference for environmental friendliness, uh, don't drive an electric car, it's, it's a small impact, there is an impact, but it's small, much bigger impact is to like, eat less meat, what people don't know, like, it's so much easier to switch, uh, to, to reduce meat consumption, not even to, to completely eliminate it, just reduce meat consumption, that's like the biggest difference you can make. Electric car, so, uh, when it comes from the factory, it comes with a CO2 penalty. So with zero kilometers on the clock, a Tesla has much more CO2 generated in its production uh, process than a Mercedes E-Class, which is comparable, let's say. So like 60% more. And then you need to drive lots of kilometers uh, and charge it from new renewable sources to catch it up. So having said that, it's a complicated answer. It's different when you produce the electric, the, the, um, the emissions in million little sources, million little cars, or at one central source where you can control it better and so on. So it's a difficult answer. Electric cars do have an impact on environment, positive, but it's it's not so big. The real big difference will come uh, with the new paradigm in mobility, because an autonomous car can change up to 40 cars. Because all of our cars are now standing there outside while we are sitting here, and they do that for 97% of the time. An autonomous car, which will be ride-sharing, 
uh, will be utilized for 70% or more of the time. And uh, this will really bring the difference. Uh, much smarter mobility, much more connected, uh, the, with more throughput, with more people uh, driving around, it will be less pollution um, and less congestion because the cars will communicate between themselves, they don't need traffic lights and so on. So that's where, re really where the potential is. An electric car, which is just your normal car and just being electric, there isn't, it's not a big change. Thank you. Uh, a few questions, maybe someone from here. Uh, first of all, thank you for holding this uh, presentation. It was really interesting. And I wanted to know, uh, you were talking about the uh, artificial intelligence and your autonomous driving systems. And are you developing your own systems or are you like borrowing them from somewhere else and building upon them? So we are not developing general autonomy. That's really a big task. So from to get from point A to point B, that's where companies like Google, Waymo, invest billions and billions of dollars, have billions of kilometers driven, and it's impossible to catch that up. Uh, so we are very much talking to these people. We are working with them in some, in some ways, I mean, the different players in the, in the industry, and there will be some interesting things coming. But uh, what we do for the C2 is this driver coach, where we develop a system for the racetrack. It's like, um, so people couldn't combine electric cars and, and performance driving uh, 10 years ago. It was an uh, oxymoron, like electric cars and racetracks. And I think we have changed that. We wanted to change it. And now, for people, it's the same with autonomous driving because they think it's going to take driving away from you. In a sense, it's true. But um, we think it can also enhance driving. It can make it more interesting. And that's why we are developing a system, which is basically so. just a use case of what we are doing. You take a car to the track. You're a millionaire that buys a two million euro car doesn't mean you're a good driver. So it takes you, hello Richard. <laughs> so it's the Richard Hammond mode. Uh, it takes you autonomously around the track for a couple of laps, uh, like gives you perfect laps. And uh, then when you take over it, it coaches you. That's why it's called driving coach, to be a better driver. Like a break here, steer there and so on. Like you have uh, missed this apex and stuff like that. Um, we buy the sensors, so we have uh, eight cameras, six radars, a LiDAR and 12 ultrasonic sensors in the car. Um, the only ECU in the car, which is not our own, is this. So we have like, I don't know, 50 different ECUs, electronic control units in the car that is our own hardware and software. But for the artificial intelligence, we use an NVIDIA uh, Pegasus uh, system. So that's a very, very powerful computer, uh, specifically developed for AI. Uh, so we use their hardware, we work very closely with NVIDIA. Uh, that was actually announced on uh, on their conference, and but we develop all the artificial intelligence and the neural networks internally. So for that, we also have a data center to collect all of the uh, data. So a car generates uh, like what one car driving eight hours per day for like two hundred <coughs> days, like so one year. It's it's three petabytes of data. So that's a lot of money. So one petabyte is like I think five hundred thousand euros, something like that, with redundancy. Uh, so, um, so we have the data storage to do that. We have the um, the uh, machine learning uh, computing power at the data center to crunch all of that data, um, and we are developing all the uh, perception, uh, the route planning, all the whole software for the self driving. But we are not doing the hardware for the self driving. Uh, thank you. Could you please repeat that? No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, do we have another question? Uh, the, the, Maybe the, uh, we didn't really have a lady yet. Please. Uh, mm. I have one question. It's not connected with um, uh, technology or art, but I wonder, I uh, read in one article when you said uh, at your new location you will have a, a new campus, naturally environment with animals, crops. How is it connected with your passion for cars? Thank uh. you. So that's really important for me. Like I think the environment where people work is really important because you spend so much time there. Like at home, you just sleep. You, you, like it's less important, I think, than the place where you work. Uh, so okay, that's me. But I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, I I think uh, it's very important that the work environment is great. 
currently it's not the case, unfortunately, because in the location where we are, we were 12 people when we came there, and now we have 500 in the same location, so it's a mess, it's, it's terrible at the moment. It's too many people, too less space. So I want to really make a very nice uh, facility for, for the employees to feel good, to feel great. And I love nature. Uh, I, I think people are made to spend time in nature. So uh, the location is really good. I cannot say it yet because we didn't fully secure the location because um, it's, uh, it's government papers and stuff like that. And until we are sure about getting the, the land, I, won't, I don't want to, to the people to get excited. And then if it doesn't happen, then they will ask me why. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's the right thing to do, to combine nature uh, as much as possible in the workplace. Um, and to have people who, who work their asses off, who spend a lot of time in that company, to also relax, enjoy. So what we also want to do is a kindergarten, uh, to produce our own food there, like to have uh, op open spaces for public, like that everybody can walk in. And like, I, I hate fences. Uh, everybody tells me in the company we have to put fences and security and stuff like that. I don't think so. I think, we're, like I like this open approach where also anybody can come to a certain point and, uh, and like, interact with, with the company so uh, for me space is really important and i think uh, when we already do this we should do it right which means for me including nature thank you somebody from this side let me come to you please please Dajan, don't get up <laughs> hi thank you for the lovely presentation i'm just wondering uh, in which uh, capacity will you use uh, laser scanning technology I saw an ad for a job hosting so I'm wondering about that so. okay laser scanning well that's uh, something that's nothing new nothing innovative really it's it's quite common now in the industry and so you might have seen in some of the slides uh, what a machine that is used for quality control uh, and measuring is a CMM so a computer controlled measuring uh, uh, probe so it's basically a uh, like uh, measuring the points of of, uh, of a part, so it's creating a point cloud by touching every like point manually. Uh, lasers are uh, modern systems; like they can uh, scan uh, complex surfaces. So the the CMM machine is good for <coughs> simple mechanical components where you have flat surfaces and so on. But a really complex geometry, like for a tool for a carbon fiber part, that's done best with the, with a laser scanner, and that's basically what, what we are looking for. So we are now establishing this department to, like, when a, when a mold is made, either by us or by a supplier, that we can scan it and see the tolerances and compare it to the CAD data. So basically that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for two more questions, so please keep it short. Uh, I'll give it to you, please. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a two-part question. One is, you said you only sleep at home, so would you say that uh, your work life and your sacrifices, uh, are they worth uh, of the personal uh, fulfillment? And the other one is, what advice would you give to young, I don't know, industrial designers or engineers or even to you at the year 2009? Thank you. Yeah, so that's a choice that everybody has to make for himself. Like, for for me, like I don't look at it from a personal perspective because uh, the company wouldn't survive now without me uh, for some time still. So it's it's not a choice about me. It's a choice for five hundred other people directly and many more indirectly. So I don't think it's really a choice. I, I have to do it, and it's like it's like you're gambling. You're all in, and there's no turning back. So. Uh, so for me, that's not really a choice. I, I never think about it that way because, I, for me, the company is above me, like above my personal sacrifices. Is it worth? I don't know. Like, I really don't know. Like, I don't go skiing. I don't go on vacations and stuff like that. I don't. I don't need it. It just works like that. I don't know. Um, so uh, everybody has to make a choice for himself. And uh, for an advice, I think. You know, not everybody should be an entrepreneur. Like, it's really tough and uh, it's a lot of responsibility and uh, you have to, like, I think everything you do, doesn't matter what, uh, that you have to make those sacrifices. It doesn't matter if you have a, like, bakery shop or a, you know, hot dog stand. Uh, 
uh, or, or a car company, that it's just a lot of hard work. So uh, I think people, uh, there is no quick money, there is no easy money. I think, uh, like I was talking with my colleagues the other day, we were in CES and I was thinking, so guys, what do you think in this industry? Like, where's the easy money? Like, like we are working like crazy. And you know, you see these stories of, you know, a game company making, you know, Angry Birds or something like that, and they make billions and stuff, WhatsApp and so on. But in the auto industry, like there's so many different disciplines. So where is the easy money? Like where can you do it, you know, easily and um, and and you know have high profits? Um, and I don't think there is really. Like there are some of these really uh, exam like exceptions that just like are one uh, you know little percentage of of. Uh, everything that you see and uh, uh, for everything else for every normal uh, job for every normal company it's difficult because you have competition you have customers you have investors you have employees and so on so there is no easy way so I think if you want to be an entrepreneur you have to be ready to give up uh, a lot of things and to sacrifice a lot of things because there is no easy money thank you uh, somebody else what? What? somebody else <laughs> Okay. I think this guy is trying to get from the beginning. Oh, uh, which guy? Which guy? The guy with, uh, with the selfie stick. Uh, could you please hand it? Okay, thank you. Such a music. Thank you, Marte, uh, for the help and for your presentation. So, um, you have great as a member of the Limax family, and on the, one of the last slides, I saw that. Uh, Ducati as well as Rimac is a member of the Volkswagen Audi family so my question is is there or will be there something going on with uh, electric motorbikes uh, <laughs> thank you so um, great is kind of an electric motorcycle the, the G12 it's like more motorcycle than a, than a bicycle really um, we have a lot of guys that are enthusiastic about motorcycles and want to do it like from a from an engineer's perspective, uh, I think it's a really bad business. I think it's really, really difficult to make an electric bike and to make it successful. Uh, technically, I, I, it's not difficult. Like the guy, one of the guys, one of the designers, he has done like a, uh, for his master's thesis, he has done a, a concept of a coffee racer, and he built like a little prototype, and it looked amazing, like really cool, and everybody's like, yeah, let's do it. But it's just like you will put like 20 million euros in that and never see them back. So in the end, you know, businesses like we can daydream all day long, but uh, I don't want to bankrupt the company and uh, send 500 people home. <laughs> so unfortunately, motorcycles, in my opinion, like Ducati just announced they're going to make an electric one. Um, there are some people working on it. There is the Italian company in Egica, which we know quite well. Uh, but uh, to be honest, I don't think, like, at least we cannot compete there. I don't think there is a business model for us, so we are not working on it. Thank you. Uh, somebody else for this? And probably the last <laughs> question that was... Thank you, Mata, uh, for your amazing work and inspiration over the years. Uh, I remember <laughs> that race in front yeah, of you this You were here, right? I actually recorded part, I remember, we had part of the video. My question is a little fun one. Uh, who would you compare better yourself uh, to? Elon Musk, uh, Steve Jobs, or uh, who was the third guy? <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, well, I really admire Elon Musk. I really admire him and what he has done. I think people that are um, attacking him don't really like... It's a lot of hate for, for not really um, objective reasons, I think. Like, he is doing mistakes like everybody, but... Um, so, uh, I think he's a great guy, but I don't like to compare myself. Like, I think that like, these guys have achieved so much more than we have. Like, maybe Elon Musk 20 years ago when he had his first company, which was PayPal. Uh, so, I guess we are there now, like, like Elon's PayPal. Uh, so maybe Elon Musk 20 years ago, yes, but uh, I still have a long way to go to catch up Elon and I'm not sure if I want to do that, like spend my whole life like he does, and what, like I do now. Uh, it's pretty crazy. He's, he is a guy who sacrifices a lot. I'm not sure how, how uh, uh, people, if people really appreciate that, like 
this guy can walk away any day with billions of dollars in his pocket and he doesn't do it. He sleeps on the factory floor. He, you know, doesn't go home for days, just like you saw in the pictures. And uh, like to make the world a better place. And he really believes that. And I agree with him, like it's basics. I think that's the best thing that's happening currently in the world, really. Like, I think the purpose of life is to explore, like to fulfill our curiosity. And with SpaceX, he's, he's coming uh, closer to that. So I really admire him. He has done a lot of things, but I wouldn't compare myself to him. Okay, and the last question. Uh, somebody from this side. Okay, just a second. Thank you, Matt. Hello, Matt. I'm a huge fan uh, about you and Mr. Adriano. So I have a one question about the design of the cars. So everything that you make in the car, interior and exterior, do, does the parts, are they made in Croatia or are they made somewhere outside of the Croatia? And the second question is, uh, in your opinion, what is the best designed car right now except Rimas Automobili? Thank you. So for the concept one, we went really extreme. Like, uh, I, I'm just now making a video of that. I want to show like how crazy we went in making everything here, like everything in Svetanelda. Uh, by the way, if you are really interested in that, you have factory tours, you can just book on our website and see everything, how we do it. Um, so that was really extreme, how, how deep we went with the concept one, like everything you see from outside and inside, other than the, uh, than the uh, wheels, like the tires and the brakes, uh, like all the carbon fiber parts, the chassis, the interior, all the parts, even the seat was done uh, in Svetanida for the concept one. The whole infotainment system, of course, we buy the screen, but the system is ours. All the machine parts, um, the glass, for example, we don't make it, but it's a Croatian company, which is called Lippi Glass. Um, so the battery pack, uh, but uh, for the C2, it was impossible to do it like that. So because we are, we want to produce almost uh, one car per, like including the Pinion Farina project, it's like one car per, per week, uh, one car per day, I think. Or one car every two or three days. I don't know. So um, uh, this uh, this was impossible to do everything in that way. Like for the concept one. So for example, now we have a supplier for the seat. We didn't want to develop our own seat for that car and so on. But it's still, I think, the most vertically integrated company um, producing sports cars. So for example, just to give you an example. So drawing the the parts and then doing the simulations. Uh, so this is all done internally. Then doing the engineering. Then when you, after many of these loops, you have a part, which is, you have a drawing of the part. Then we have another department developing the tool and the production process, the, the industrialization of it. Then the tool goes into machining. We have people there from the, the drawings of the tool making the patterns for the machine, for the CNC machine. Then we mill the tool. We produce the, the tool internally. You saw the machines in one of the pictures. Then the tool goes to our carbon fiber production which is inside the same factory. We produce the carbon fiber part. We trim it there, bond it if necessary. Um, we uh, paint it uh, and put it on the car. So from the first idea, from the white sheet of paper until the carbon fiber part is on the car mounted to the, for the final customer, it never leaves our fence. Um, so it's quite vertically integrated. Uh, and plus on top of that, we do lots of things for other car manufacturers. So I was always like, obsessed with doing things internally. Uh, other people would consider it totally um, unsensible. So we have 250 engineers. Pagani maybe has 30 or 40, uh, also doing supercars. So it's a completely different approach. Uh, some uh, sports car manufacturers don't produce one single part in their car, which is also a legit, legitimate choice. Nothing wrong about that. It's just a, wrong, a different approach. Uh, we have the approach that we try to do as much as possible internally. Uh, but with the C2, we are trying to be more sensible. And the second part of the question, what is the most best design car? Oh, best design car. Okay, wow, well, that's a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. Well, obviously, the classic cars are beautiful. Like a lot of Dutch Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there are, there are some really beautiful classic cars, like old air-cooled 911s or the BMW 507 or, uh, you know, like cars like that. The usual suspects, uh, E-Type. Uh, those kind of cars, but for modern cars, um, like I love many cars. I like if I had the money, I would buy like a bunch of different cars. I really like Pagani. Uh, it's a little bit uh, too kitsch, but 
but at the same time it's it's very artistic I, I like the details of it I like the LaFerrari I think it's a nice car uh, I like the Aston Martin Valkyrie just because it's so extreme like it's absolutely around aerodynamics and performance not about anything else like it's totally you know no compromise on performance um, and yeah sport like modern sports cars those those kind of sports cars I like most okay that's it uh, people we are running out of time thank you once again and please applause Martin. Thank you.